going to have them do now is um, share a really brief overview about the company they're working at now or companies they worked at in the past, just so we get a little bit more of a sense. We've got an intro, but let's dive in a little deeper. And after that, we'll talk about some of your job content, like what you actually do on a given day. Um, do you want to start, Michael? Sure. Writing that uh, Tell us a little bit about the yeah. food project. I, my name is Michael Iceland. Uh, I'm the outreach coordinator at The Food Project. We're a nonprofit that's been around for about 20 years here in the Boston area. Um, and we've worked with over a thousand teenagers. We're a youth development program and a sustainable agriculture program. So we're using farming as a platform for community engagement, uh, where we're really developing young leaders. And also now we've, we've sort of turned our focus to food access, so making sure that people, regardless of their geography, their economic status, their, their personal history have access to the same fresh, healthy foods and ideally local foods that are coming from within a sustainable food system. So that's that's it in a nutshell. I could go on for probably about three days. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good nutshell. Our path. And Karen, I know you've got multiple companies to talk about. But. Well, I guess um, the best thing is to give you a, a time frame. So in 2006, along with two other um, women, we began uh, a company called Earth Hour Only Home because we had um, gone to, we had been made aware of a um, Green Roof conference that was taking place in Boston, and we went and sort of fell in love with the concept of putting gardens across our city and thought, what a great idea. Um, what happened was we had mistakenly understood the cost of what it would take to do that. We understood it was going to cost about $7 a square foot to put a green roof on a building. And we checked in, roofs generally cost three, five dollars. So we figured for another couple of dollars, we could get everybody to put green roofs on. Lo and behold, the green roof assembly from, the, from above the waterproofing up to your plants was considered the seven dollars. And the waterproofing <coughs> was whatever it was going to be. Um, anywhere from 5 to 15 or $20 for the waterproofing, and then, of course, your green roof is probably 7 from $15. So suddenly we were in a whole different game. And we had incorporated, and we were ready to go, so we thought, okay, well, how is it that Germany has so many green roofs? And how is it that Chicago got so many green roofs? So we looked into um, the fact that they all found um, government incentives to get going. And we thought, that can't be too difficult. We'll go to our city council, and they'll fall in love with the idea the same way we did. And um, sure, they loved the idea, but they didn't want to do anything about it. And no one really talked about global warming in any direct context, even just five years ago. It's just incredible how much things have shifted within the five years that span. At any rate, we, we were undaunted. We spent time with our city councilors with our state reps, state senators. We went to the Capitol. We talked to all the representatives and our, our senators there. And um, even Senator Kerry knows this brochure. So nothing happened. And we're still at a standstill. New York City has put in a subsidy of $4.50 per square foot. Um, others, um, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Washington, DC, there are a number of places around that are starting to catch on. Boston is still sitting. But in the meantime, what we decided, um, one of my co-founders and myself decided, okay, we have a for-profit, we're ready to go whenever that happens, but in the meantime, let's make some awareness, <coughs> let's, let's get beyond just our for-profit. So we founded Foundation for a Green Future with the um, intent to start programs in our schools, start to educate students and the communities about the importance of greening our urban space. And in the meantime, we started learning about many more things. Um, um, living walls, for example, which are um, equally important in our cities in terms of cooling and water management and air filtration and energy conservation. Plus, they look beautiful, and they make buildings look beautiful. So seven months into that, we had an opportunity to um, begin a public festival, um, a festival that had taken place, was not going to be able to continue, and. We had a date all set, and we were 10 weeks out. <laughs> and we um, hurried to put some exhibitors on Boston City Hall Plaza. We ended up with 125 exhibitors and um, um, a full spread of speakers and um, uh, all kinds of entertainment and whatnot. We had a, 
a, a very good success. About 5,000 people came through that year. In fact, Northeastern had a, had a table at our event. Um, he was there. So then the following year, um, we had a little bit more time to plan, and we continued, and we built it to um, a population, an estimate of about 50,000 people. Last year, we were at about 75,000 people. Over, um, I think we had 226 exhibitors. We had all kinds of food vendors, and we had more than 80 um, live enter, uh, 80 performances on three live stages um, that span five continents. They, um, we are the largest multicultural environmental festival in the region. So this year, we're going into it with quite a different spin. Um, the Boston Metro has approached us and they want to be our main um, media um, partner for Boston Green Fest. Univision, the major Spanish um, TV channel, is going to be doing on-site cover on, on coverage. So now this has now become an event that began with just starting from green roofs, and now we're into anything and everything that can be sustainable in our lives. But we're, we're trying to come back, and now that we're bringing more people forward and, and out of their homes and their offices, we really want to help them understand our, our initial mission, which our graphic designer came up with a fantastic promotion of putting a green roof on our, as a thinking cap. Um, that this year, we really want to see what we can do if we all start to understand the importance of what it means to making our roofs and our cities sustainable. So I'll finish with uh, Let's see, my background, uh, I guess I got my uh, mechanical engineering doctorate from Columbia and uh, had a postdoc, you know, things like that. Um, uh, my first exposure to the real world was uh, Wall Street, uh, about a year and a half there, again, doing derivatives, uh, very interesting work, had zero utility for the universe except maybe your own pocketbook. Um, I left there uh, fortuitously and uh, uh, took some time off to figure out what to do with my life. I uh, found Evergreen Solar. I did not found the company. I found the company. And uh, I basically showed up at the doorstep and said, I want to work for you guys. Now, this was in 99. And they said, sure, show us you can do. And show them the portfolio, what I can do. Uh, being an engineer for a renewable energy company is no different than being a, uh, a company that builds weapons, except you're actually doing something that you can be proud of. Because um, uh, I actually did work on weapons previously. Uh, uh, my first job was putting uh, rivets in fighter aircraft. Um, but the, the big thing about uh, the renewable energy industry as an engineer or someone with a technical background is, uh, at least that I've found, is that it's incredibly easy to make a solar cell. Uh, you can do it in your kitchen, actually. It won't be efficient, but you can do it. Uh, the, the trick is to making it cheaply. And yes, Evergreen Solar is left because they couldn't with China, um, but a lot of my work at Evergreen Solar involved some very basic mechanical engineering tasks, you know, take this cup here, fill up that cup, don't drip any water in between because it's really not water, it's acid, or um, uh, do this cheaply, don't, uh, you know, it's easy to make cookies, you know, I can make cookies in my kitchen, but doing it cheaply and doing it repeatedly and possibly doing it sustainably, uh, the, the big selling point for Evergreen was that the amount of silicon that they used uh, and the amount of energy they took to make a solar cell was incredibly cheap. Now, the rest of it, you know, putting it in the panel, shipping it and all that stuff, uh, unfortunately is pretty much the same around the world. You can't get around it. Uh, and then there are, you know, financial considerations. But a lot of my work involved that, at least at Evergreen. So 10 years of automating processes and making things work. Uh, after I left Evergreen, uh, I'm a consultant now. This is my, my sole proprietorship, LLC, Clifford Engineering. Um, I've worked on other projects which are not necessarily sustainable or renewable. However, there is a section of my work which is very much sustainable and very interesting. It's called due diligence work. Um, say you're a, uh, you've got some grand idea. You want to make uh, solar cells really cheaply and uh, in the middle of the country. Um, the government's going to give you a loan. Well, that's, that's really great. Um, however... Does your idea actually work? Uh, I've been walked into places and seen things and said, oh, that's really cool, that's really cool, that's really cool, and then show me the core piece of your technology. I'm like, okay, and well, it's not ready for prime time, which means would I want to put in $400 million into this company? No. So a lot of what I do is um, 
now is going to a, a firm, poking around and saying, is this sustainable? You know, can you actually pull this off for the amount of money you're, we're willing to give you? I mean, that's $400 million. We could be doing green roofs. We could be doing community farming. Or we want to make solar panels. Uh, so that's what my bulk of my work is right now. And uh, I'll leave with that.